All right, so it's seven o'clock on the dot and we can go ahead and start with our introduction. So again, my name is Maria Miglio and I am the DMC Vice President for ACOS and Carrie is also hosting this with me if you wanna introduce yourself. Hey guys, <clears throat> my name is Carrie at Copigo. I am the MUC VP at ACOS. So yeah, I've emailed a few of you guys. So thank you for being here today. And then we also wanted to thank OBIGS, OSMP, and SNAPS for helping us co-host this event and for helping promote it. So now we are going to go ahead and let the panelists introduce themselves. So just a quick introduction of maybe like your name, where you grew up, where you went to undergrad, and what residency program you're going into. And let's go ahead and start with Brandon. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon. I grew up just um, in St. John's, just north of East Lansing. I did my undergrad at Oakland University. And then um, I was a base student at Genesis. And then for residency, I matched into obstetrics and gynecology at TriHealth in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my name is Jake Best. I'm from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Um, I went to undergrad at Michigan State. And I, uh, doing ortho next year at Henry Ford McComb. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jake. And Eric? I'm Eric. I'm uh, from Swartz Creek, Michigan. Uh, did undergrad at MSU. Um, I'm doing ortho at Ascension Genesis. Thank you. Irvi, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Irvi. I did my undergrad at University of Toronto, so that's in Canada. And my base hospital was DMC Sinai Grace, and I mashed into Henry Ford McComb. Thank you. And Michael? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Sapanich. I grew up in Shelby Township, Michigan. Um, I went to Michigan State for my undergrad, and I matched uh, orthopedic surgery at McLaren McComb. Thank you. And Hannah? Hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I grew up in a small town called North Branch in the Thumb of Michigan. I went to MSU for undergrad and I matched general surgery at McLaren McComb. Thank you. And I think our last one is Sonal. Hi, I'm Sonal. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. So you probably don't know where I went to undergrad. It's called Simon Fraser University. Um, my base hospital was Beaumont Farmington Hills and I matched into general surgery at Sinai Grace. Thank you. Is there any panelists who I missed that still needs to introduce themselves? All right. So we can dive right into the questions because we have a lot of them. So I kind of separated them by chunks so it's not just a whole bunch of random questions. And we are going to start with why did you choose your specialty? And you guys can just kind of jump in and answer questions that you think you would like to answer. So we'll go ahead and let anyone start with this one. I can start. Thanks, Brandon. So, um, so I chose obstetrics and gynecology. When I was trying to determine what kind of specialty I wanted to go into, there were um, some things I wanted. I knew I wanted to incorporate into my practice. I knew I wanted to do a little bit of primary care, some. Um, longevity um, with patient relationships and establishing um, long-term care, but also wanted to do surgery um, and also sort of wanted to balance between a clinic and also work in a hospital. Um, so with obstetrics and gynecology, I felt like that was one of the specialties that I sort of had um, about all five of those aspects that I didn't find in a lot of other specialties. So that's what really drew me to obstetrics. I'm pretty much the same, so I don't want to repeat the same stuff, but, you know, I was interested in women's health. I love all things sex, and I love surgery, so this was the right fit for me. Um, I chose Gen Sur just because, like, the variety of cases you get to see, um, the traumas you get to experience, just the training in general gives you, like, a lot of options and fellowship, what you want to do afterwards, and it's just, like, a very broad scope, and I really enjoyed that. I agree with Sonal, um, but in addition, I like that you also manage patients in the hospital and deal with a lot of critical patients, um, as well as doing surgery. So I liked the balance between working in the hospital and being in the OR, and there is still some office um, incorporated with it as well. 
think for me, for orthopedic surgery, it was the ability to, to work with your hands and being able to treat chronic conditions with a um, with procedures that, that basically give you quick responses. You, you have a good feedback of, of um, their treatment in the sense that they're getting up doing the things that they weren't able to do before. And so that was a, that was a big appeal for me. So I'll kind of piggyback off of what Eric said. Um, you know, the definitive nature of several things in orthopedics um, from a surgical standpoint uh, makes it very satisfying. You can come in with pretty heavy debility and uh, whether it's, you know, repairing a fracture or, you know, replacing a joint, you can uh, give these people kind of a lot of mobility and pain-free life back which is pretty significant. Um, and I think the other part of it too is, you know, it was just something that I had shadowed in early on and I had such a strong experience with, you know, everyone I had worked with, the attendings, the residents and the students. And I think because of that positive experience, it kind of kept me motivated toward that specialty. Yeah, kind of what Mike said. And then for me, I worked in physical therapy clinics when I was in college, so. Just working with these patients, I mean, everyone wants to get better. Um, everyone's very motivated to get healthy again. That's what I really love about ortho especially. And pretty much everything that Eric and Mike have already said, you know, people just, they get better. Uh, success rates of surgery are just, you know, through the roof. So it's just a very satisfying field, very tangible results. And um, yeah, it's one of those things where you, know, you shadow it you know, you love it and that's what you want to do, then that's what you should do. Thank you guys. And I just wanted to add real quick for anyone who is listening, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. because We are going to do like a little Q&A at the end or we might mix them in with the questions that we're asking. So the next question is, did you guys have any leadership positions or volunteering that played a role in your residency application? I can talk about this. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, part of uh, Spartan Street Medicine. So I think, um, you know, I always wanted to work with the underserved population. So that was a huge part of my residency application, a huge part of what I was looking in programs, being able to serve the populations. Um, and so I think that played a big role for me personally. I think for me, a big part of my application on the volunteering side was like, if there's anything you've been doing since like high school, like any organization you've been working with, you know, it doesn't have to do with you know, medicine even, um, I think showing that you've been kind of committed to something for a long time is something that residencies really like to see. So, you know, if you've been sticking around with whatever it may be, it doesn't even matter, like, you know, the hours that you're putting in, obviously everyone's busy in school, but just kind of showing that you will stick around and that you kind of stick to your commitments, um, that's pretty big. So um, just something to kind of keep in mind uh, for things to talk about for your interviews. Um, I also did some medical mission trips to Mexico and Peru, and I got asked quite a bit about um, those experiences during my interviews, and I held the fundraising chair for Macomb, so I got asked quite a few questions about that in my app. Um, I think I did a lot of kind of little things for a period of time. I did some um, COVID stuff, volunteering with COVID, and then I did um, mentoring and was a part of SOSA at the time it was called SOSA and so just things like that and I also shadowed in a general surgery clinic with one of the general surgeons for a period of time so I thought that was kind of helpful too I could just talk more about um, knowing how a clinic functions and um, <coughs> that sort of stuff so um, if you don't have something for a long period of time as long as you have things that relate to the specialty that you're trying to match into I think that that's also fine. Kind of going what was already said, um, you know, the longevity of the volunteer opportunities that you have, I think is huge. Um, and I think the biggest thing is opposed to maybe what it is, is how you can articulate why it matters to you and why you stuck with it. I think that's usually something that, you know, people are really interested in hearing about it can make a difference. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, finding opportunities to maybe shadow. I know there's not always a lot of time, but even peripherally just to shadow or volunteer within the specialty you like, you know, you never know who, who they know or what kind of pieces of wisdom they can offer you in terms of kind of guiding you on an application process. So, you know, those small interactions can be worthwhile. Um, if you can find things available, you know, in your specialty, especially when you're at your base hospitals, 
maybe on you know a less demanding rotation? I think for um, also just to add for volunteer experience, I did a lot of work in Pontiac, Michigan, and this came up a lot during my residency interviews is that they want to see that you will devote your time working with some underserved um, populations. Um, since a lot of the patients you'll be seeing in your resident clinics will most likely be medically underserved um, populations. So I think that gives you a ground to talk about and um, show that you can relate and be compassionate to sort of that population. Yeah, that's great. And we will keep on rolling. So kind of talking about pre-clerkship, was there anything significant that you did during your pre-clerkship that helped you in applying and getting accepted to your residency program? I think I did uh, some research opportunities through the Sports Injury Research Lab. Um, that really kind of helped me uh, get a better understanding of, of reading research, um, being part of some of the, the projects that go into um, what makes those research papers so well or written so, so good um, in that sense. So I thought doing research during pre-clerkship was, was something that really helped and stood out in my application. I think another thing that helps a lot, um, I got asked for a few of my interviews was for the, um, kind of like the like street clinics they can do at the multiple sites. So when you have your part of Spartan Street Medicine or a Huda Clinic, any of those things is a really great opportunity to talk about just why you did those things and really highlighting how you kind of, especially for a surgical, you know, residency, obviously hands-on training is so important. So that's when you can kind of tie in like, hey, you know, studying from the books and I wanted to get a jump start in my clerkship skills and you know doing great thing for the community too so if you're a part of those organizations um, you will most likely like for sure get asked about it and it's a really good thing to talk about just kind of showing how you like to do you know just like to study all righty so kind of we talked about research a little bit but did anyone else do research during medical school and did that help with your competitiveness for your residency program so I completed a master or I was actually in the process of completing my master's in epidemiology when I was in the first year of medical school. And then, so I finished it and I had to obviously continue on my research. And so I definitely think for me personally, also if anyone caught that I was completing it during the first year of med school, that was definitely another thing that was brought up in interviews. But if they didn't catch it, obviously it was the research that for me, I think did make a difference in getting and being interviewed topic points. For me, just, you know, at the places I had interviewed, it wasn't necessarily, I did have research, but it was from, you know, more so my senior year of college. If you have opportunities maybe during your clerkship years to, you know, hop on a project, I know some of my friends had done it, um, you know, more power to you, but was it necessarily something that I found that they focused on. I mean, obviously it's something people would like to see, but if it wasn't there, it wasn't something that was really noticed or really talked upon much uh, from my perspective. I kind of had a different experience. Um, at one of my interviews, I had at least two um, people that were, some of the surgeons that were interviewing me asked me directly about what research I had done in medical school. And I feel like I was kind of lacking on that. I did do a quick kind of small project just within like the few months leading up to ERAS. And I feel like that really saved my ass because everyone asked me about research. So I do think it's important. And if you can get involved in something significant early and kind of carry that on or have some research in medical school that you can talk about, I think that would be really helpful. If it helps, the place that I mashed, they never asked me about my research. So I do think it's very dependent on the program that you want. Um, if you're very headset on a specific program, a specific specialty, I would look at what their current residents are doing, how involved they're in research to really see if research would make a difference for you. Yeah, I would just add, if you're sort of set on going 
to her, it's more of an academic um, program um, than a community-based one. They're going to value your research and your participation in it much more than a community hospital, most likely. And then I'm just going to add in these questions from the chat really quick. Um, did any of you get published while you were in medical school? And then do you think case ports are enough or does it need to be longer research? I mean, the most I heard people mention, and these weren't even like direct medical school colleagues I had, but people I had met on rotations was they did like stat pearls, which is basically kind of an abbreviated form of research. If you can get, you know, a faculty mentor who's, you know, basically has, you know, a PubMed ID and you can, it, it's basically like a case report more or less. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I came across anybody who did anything too groundbreaking, you know, while on the research trail or application trail. Oh, I'm sorry. This is David Bowes. Um, let me turn my video on. Am I on? I guess I am. Yeah. Okay. I'm an OBGYN program director. So I just want to give you my perspective. I think a lot of what the, the matched fourth years have just said <clears throat> is very accurate. I think it's specialty dependent. Um, and I think it's um, program dependent. And as has already been pointed out, look at the programs you're applying to um, and find out how important it is for that individual program. They did a big nationwide um, survey of program directors across the country in OBGYN a couple of years ago. And I think they do this periodically. And they looked at two things. One is what factors do, do you as a program director look at in terms of um, choosing a candidate for an audition slash sub I rotation? And, and likewise, what do you look at to grant a candidate <clears throat> an interview for, for residency? And at least in OBGYN, you might be surprised that research was fairly down, was fairly far down the, the, the list in terms of importance of things. But again, it's very program specific. My sense is, <clears throat> and I, I don't know specifically, but I, my sense is that if you're going for urology, you're going for orthopedics, those are highly competitive residencies. So it's one more way of filtering out um, a, a from a large group of otherwise qu very qualified candidates. So that's my two cents as a program director. I'd be happy to answer any questions as they come up. I'll, I'll sit in the background otherwise. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So another quick research question. Does anyone have any tips on how to get involved in research while in your pre-clerkship or clerkship? I would say for uh, clerkship, um, once you sort of have a general idea of maybe the specialty you're interested in, all, all residents have to complete a research project in order to graduate from the residency program. So um, they're all in the middle of a project of their own. So just um, talking with one of the residents and asking if you can get involved in the project is a pretty easy way to sort of get your foot in the door. I'd say in pre-clerkship, it's nice being part of MSU. It's such a big university and there's a lot of researchers. It doesn't have to be physician. It can be academic um, research in the sense that you're working with a PhD or something like that. I think um, trying to just do a quick Google search on who's doing what, um, depending on your specialty or what you're interested in. So for me, I searched uh, sports orthopedic research MSU or something like that. and that's how I came across Sports Injury Research Lab. And I ended up just emailing them out of, out of the blue, just asking if they needed help with data collection or anything like that. So I think just doing those easy, quick things um, kind of gets your foot in the door. Like Eric was saying, you'd be surprised by, you know, if you send out three or four emails, how many opportunities can really stem from that? Because if you email even in the general vicinity of where something might be happening, those people will forward it to, you know, the uh, research director for that project or, and things like that. So I would say both in a clerkship and pre-clerkship environment, sending those emails just in the right vicinity generally will, will get you synced up with somebody more or less. I have um, a question. Are they still running the biostats class? Is it, I think it's open to second years. Yeah, I think so. So if anyone's genuinely interested in research, 
that would also be a great opportunity to take that biostatistics course because it would prepare you. It would like you would have a skill set that you could go into clerkship with that um, you could help the residents with. But also, I know Dr. Irfan runs that course, and he's you know frequently looking for students that might be interested in research. So he's a really good person to reach out to. Um, he's very open to you know you can just email him. And if again, if someone's like really, really interested, you can email me and I could talk to Dr. Irfan. Um, the other thing, since we are on the topic of research, and I think Haley asked about how important is it that research aligns with your desired specialty. Um, so actually, a lot of my research was in internal medicine, just by, you know, my background of epidemiology. And this kind of resonates with Jake was saying earlier that if you're passionate about something and you've been doing it for a very long time, which for me, my two things were working with the underserved and doing research. So if research is something you're actually interested in and it happens to be in a different specialty, as long as you can talk about it in your interviews and you can show that you have been dedicated to it, um, I don't think it matters that it's not in your specialty. I can speak on that a little bit. I actually dual applied in general surgery and ENT because I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. So I did auditions in both and had research predominantly in ENT and it came up in some of my general surgery interviews, but I was never asked why I didn't have general surgery research or why it was ENT. So I don't think it really, you know, hurt me that it wasn't a different specialty. I think one thing that these programs are looking for, um, you know, in terms of research, because I know that when I was applying, you know, a big question from students I was rotating came up was, well, you know, how many projects do you have? You know, how many publications do you have? And I think that what's more, I can't speak to academic programs because I don't have any academic interviews, but for community programs, I think a big part of it is just um, being able to show that you know how to carry out a project from you know beginning to end, that you know how to come up with an idea, how to like research the facts, collect the data, how to write a paper, how to deal with the IRB, how to submit to a journal. Like these are all skills that you can develop, you know, even from year one, even in pieces, and it'll kind of all come together towards the end of your third year, beginning of your fourth year. And so that you have hopefully just like even one or two publications, but you can still say, you know, speak to them in volume and saying like, hey, like this is what I did for this project. This is how I contributed. And that you can show like, you know, over the course of your medical school career that you're going to be able to, like Brandon said earlier, you need to publish a project. So it's good to show that, hey, I know the skills to publish a project. So you don't need to teach them to me. Like I'm already ready to go. Um, that's going to be really, really helpful for you um, for interviews. So that was really helpful. Thank you, guys. So continuing along, some of you guys mentioned shadowing a little bit, but did you guys think that shadowing during medical school played a big role in your residency application? I think maybe in terms of getting, you know, letters of rec in the specialty, um, for sure, because only because, you know, sometimes with like the subspecialty stuff, by the time you're doing your auditions, it's kind of a little late to be saying like, hey, like I need a letter like now. Um, so sometimes if you're at a base hospital and there's a lot of faculty in your specialty, sometimes it's nice when, you know, it's not to say sometimes anesthesia and radiology isn't busy, but the way we had it orchestrated is we kind of had afternoons free sometimes. So, you know, maybe you could pop into clinic for a day you know, if it's not a busy day for that surgeon and just spend some time. So they at least have an idea of who you are before you just show up at their door, you know, asking for a letter. Um, I thought that was fairly useful, um, you know, especially at your base hospitals. For me, I did a sort of, in clerkship, you, um, you have two weeks off before Christmas and I did a two week sort of clinical enrichment, um, doing obstetrics and gynecology because at that time I wasn't sat on the specialty. So I wanted to get a little bit of exposure but I also knew um, Genesis had a residency program. And when I did my third year rotation, I wanted to be maybe um, ready and not have to be learning the ropes when I um, first got onto that rotation. So um, in that regard, I think it helped um, just making sure or confirming that's what you really want to go into. And also um, sorry, having a heads up um, of being able to make a good first impression when you land on your first day for that, uh, that rotation. I'll piggyback off that a bit and what Michael said, it can be really helpful for letters of rec, but also I wanna add, say if you are really interested in a program, but you weren't able to get an audition or spend any time there, 
you could message their residents or um, get some information from their program coordinator to coordinate some time with an attending to see if you could go in and shadow for the day or for the weekend. Um, that would kind of help get your face out there, get them, you know, to meet you and you to meet them. And that could be also another um, helpful shadowing experience. I think I was able to use um, a lot of my shadow experience as part of my personal statement. So that, that really helped create kind of a, those like writing juices to be able to come up with good stories of, of the reasons why I want to do that specialty. So it really helped create that backbone of my personal statement. So for me to, to echoing what uh, Mike had said about uh, having the letter of recommendation, that, that was also a good, good factor as well. For me, shadowing just helped getting exposed to the specialty. So, you know, if you want to do anything that's not in the core third year curriculum. So if you wanted to do ortho or ENT, urology, anything like that, it's really important to shadow so that you kind of know like A, what you're getting yourself into and to get, you know, kind of start meeting people. It's these like, you know, surgical specialties are very small worlds and like people really know each other. And you're going to find that if you shadow a doc for even one day, and, you know, you have a good experience, he might kind of connect you to, you know, another doc that actually connected to a residency program. You know, that surgeon doesn't necessarily need to be, um, a, you know, teaching professor, they just need to be, you know, kind of in the system and they all are. So it's really helpful to get exposed to the specialty because um, you're not gonna get that exposure through Michigan State. And then um, just like was said, you know, with the stories kind of coming up with, you know, ideas for your personal statements, really good. And then also it's gonna help you with your auditions because you kind of know how a service runs a little bit at least. You kind of know, you know, where to stand in the OR, how you can help out the OR staff, all that kind of stuff. And you just, you know, a few shadowing experiences can kind of help garner those skills. And we talked about rotations a little bit there. So can you guys all say where you did, like what your base hospital was and if that affected where you applied to for residency slash received interviews? So I did get accepted at my base hospital. Um, you know, it was funny going into it. I, I did think that the base hospital had a huge part to play in that. And to a certain extent it does, but I think if anything, it really still was just the opportunity to audition with that team and then interview with them. It was over zoom, but I, I was surprised. Maybe I thought that being a base student would have been more of an impactful factor. And it wasn't a way but not in a huge way. It wasn't something that made you, you know, move you up in the pile. It was something that maybe made them say, oh yeah, you know, we know this person, they're nice. But it didn't, it wasn't something that I don't think had a massive impact in ranking at least, which was to my surprise. Cause you know, early on in my clerk, pre-clerkship years, I'm like, you know, where you go for your base is gonna have this huge, huge effect. And it did, but not as much as I thought it was going to. I think like Mike, I ended up staying at my base hospital, but. For me, it was a location. Um, uh, Grand Blank, Ascension Genesis, that, that's 10 minutes from my hometown. So for me, it was being able to stay home, being able to still be around my family and stuff like that. Uh, but there are also other factors too of being a base student. You got to see the ins and out of, of that program, not just during one month or during audition season when they're also putting on their best for students that are rotating through as well. You also got to see them through their, um, throughout the year, throughout um, third year, fourth year. Um, so that was a great opportunity to be able to see that, okay, these are really good. This is a really good program. You got to see the fives and on what they get to do, what the autonomy is. You got to see a lot of different things that maybe you wouldn't get to see in one month. So for me, that, that was a great opportunity. For me, for me, for obstetrics, um, for a lot of obstetrics and gynecology programs, oh, um, a lot of the patients you can deliver for obstetrics depends on the NICU um, level they have. Um, so at Ascension Genesis, they were a level two, I believe, or one, I'm not completely sure, but that means they can deliver 32 weeks and up. And I think that was um, a good experience knowing that um, there's other programs that have NIC, um, NICU level threes and um, knowing the difference between um, those programs being able to deliver 23 weeks and up compared to some, maybe some of the smaller programs that don't have those resources. 
I think that your base hospital basically is what you make it. I was at Beaumont Farmington Hills. I didn't match there because um, I just found another program that I thought would be a better fit for me. But the whole time I thought that I wanted to be there just because I tried to get into that um, hospital for clerkship because I was interested in their general surgery program. But then two years later, I you know was auditioning other places and I decided maybe another place was a better fit for me. So um, I really do think it is what you make it. So if you go into a base hospital knowing that you want to be in whatever program and you, you know, make the extra effort to hang out with the residents, um, get to know the attendings, you know, express your interest, it could really help you out. But if you're not interested in their program for um, whatever that you want to do, I think that you can also go to other programs and do the same thing. Being at a base hospital doesn't limit you. Um, it could give you an advantage if you make it that way, but not necessarily. And then real quick, before we go on with questions, we just had another panelist join us. So I'm going to let her introduce herself if she's ready. Hi, um, I just hopefully figured this out. Are you, can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry I'm late. Um, I just moved to Virginia today, um, which is where my residency's at, and I'm moving all my stuff in. I was like, oh crap, it's 730. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, I think, um, oh, sorry, I guess I can introduce myself. My name is Stacy. Um, I matched into neurosurgery at Carillion Clinic, Virginia Tech. So if anybody has any questions about uh, matching neurosurgery, or even if you're just interested in the field, um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. And I'm sure um, at the end of this, we can give our email addresses out or something for everyone. Thank you, Stacey. And then we can keep on going with questions. So back to the base hospitals, what are some important things to consider when you are choosing your base hospital? Um, I guess since I'm <laughs> talking, I can go ahead and uh, speak for neurosurgery. So specifically for me, um, being a DO, uh, it was important to me to try to go to a base hospital that had a home program that was friendly to DOs. So in my case, that was Ascension Providence. Um, that's where I did my audition rotations. And I think you guys are allowed one uh, as far as, I don't know if it's all of surgery or just neurosurgery, but um, I think you're allowed one away this year. Is that correct? Possibly. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd have to look. But um, so, yeah, that's something to think about if they have a program um, that's friendly for DOs and a, a specialty that you're wanting to go into. Um, the other thing to, that I think is important to think about is um, who are you getting your letters of recommendation from? So are these um, gonna be, are, are you gonna be working with people who have a lot of influence in the field that you're going into? Um, and are the letters that you're getting from the people at your base hospital gonna have a big impact um, nationwide when you're sending out your application? So that's kind of um, the two things that I was thinking about for neurosurgery. I would probably agree with that totally in a sense, you know, when you're getting your letters, um, it, it's not like the volunteer thing where it can just kind of be anything as long as you can explain it. I mean, it's not about just getting someone who's known in the specialty, but kind of have an idea maybe of where your top, let's say five to six places are where you'd apply and maybe try to build networking and relationships with people associated with those programs, because it does make a difference, um, especially in those small circles you know, DO orthopedics in Michigan is there's a lot of programs, but it's a pretty small group and a lot of them work at multiple hospitals. So, you know, find people maybe with several affiliations and find opportunities maybe to shadow or work with them because, you know, it doesn't always have to be the fanciest person you get a letter from, but if it's from someone you know and trust and they can speak to your qualifications well, that obviously carries a decent amount of weight. I can make a comment about letters of recommendation also. This is, um, sorry, my video off again. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter if you see me or not. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So I think that um, when you're thinking about letters of recommendation, plan early, try to pick people who know you, as I think has already been stated, 
um, it could speak to your attributes, but but also find out from your colleagues and, and friends who um, is reliable because it's, you need to get those letters in in a timely ma in a manner. And a lot of people are very busy and they mean well, but they don't always get the letters in. And if possible, pick somebody who trains residents, who's involved in resident training, because it's really important for a person who writes a letter to understand and know what a program director or a program is looking for. And if you're not in the day-to-day -day business of training residents, you may lose that perspective. And so it really is helpful to have that kind of a, a individual write a letter for you. Thank you for adding that in. So we can keep on going with rotation questions. There were a lot of questions about away rotations and if anyone did that and how they were able to set that up and what the timeline was like for that. I think for a lot of us, we were applying through co like the peak of COVID. So it was really hard and, and having to go through that. Um, but the nice thing about being part of MSU Com is the SES system. So it was very easy to email coordinators and, and schedule different auditions. Some did make you go through VSAS, which was kind of annoying, but um, most of them were pretty open to just emailing, which is pretty nice. Um, I think MSU had a restriction on us last year with um, applying out of state. So I didn't really have any experiences with trying to schedule auditions out of state. My auditions, I stayed within the MSU's like base hospital system. So they send out a nice chart to you on how to apply. Some you can just email program or the student coordinators, others you still have to go through BSAS. So I use that for the most part. Um, yeah, no out of state ones though for me. <laughs> Alrighty, and that pretty much ties up our questions on rotations. Oh yeah, can you guys say explain what VSAS is real quick? So VSAS is like um, the equivalent of ERAS, but instead of applying for residency positions, you're applying for audition rotations. So at some point, I think like because for us it might have been a little delayed, but around like April or May. Um, there's a list of programs that are on their different specialties, different hospitals, and you can basically like you can see what their requirements are. If they need a letter for you to apply for an audition rotation, they need your board scores, um, if they are going to charge you anything extra, um, the coordinators names, and then you can choose dates so you can see which dates they're offering. And then through that portal, you can apply um, to do an audition at their institution. Perfect. Thank you. And for some hospitals and programs, they don't always use VSAS. So if you're interested in going so somewhere, I would definitely look at their website and make sure you're up to date because they'll put on there like they started accepting applications on this date or this date. So you can be, you know, the first to email that day, hopefully, and get your audition rotation all set up. I would say kind of off that, I know that there's like that Frida system through the AMC maybe. That, I was trying to use that to kind of screen and tier kind of where I wanted to go for auditions. That's not like an accurate system necessarily, and it doesn't have possibly the most up-to-date information. Um, so any institution that you're thinking about, I would just try to email their med ed person directly, and they will get you in touch with the coordinator for that specialty if, you know, that's not clear on their website. Because sometimes like those big banks where it tells you about programs, the information might just not be complete. It might be wrong or, you know, it just might not be there. Yeah, um, Frida, at least for neurosurgery, Frida was completely incorrect for almost all of the programs <laughs> that I was looking at. So definitely don't trust that. Um, and then specifically for, sorry for the noise, you guys, uh, specifically for neurosurgery, um, I definitely recommend looking on the uh, Society of Neurosurgery website, the SNS website, and that will tell you exactly um, what they require for um, applying to residency, and that'll give you a good idea for how many away rotations you can do and um, what you, um, you know, where you might kind of prioritize doing those. Also, if there are any Canadians or international students that require a visa, um, Frida is inaccurate for that as well. I think so. What about you, Sono? Sounds like a pretty yeah. bad website. <laughs> I definitely agree. All right, so I am going to pass it over to Carrie to ask some final questions here for you guys. All right, so 
Um, all right. So out of your entire application, what was one thing that really stood out for you guys? So I think maybe at least from my perspective, it was, and you know, as Dr. Bose had said, you know, if you're able to get a letter of rec from somebody who's worked in residency training or even the programs where you're applying and, you know, maybe that extra phone call to vouching for somebody, I mean, things like that, you know, cause it gets to a certain point when, when you're on that interview list where most things are equal at that point. I mean, you have pretty equal amount of research, your scores are pretty much in the ballpark. And I, I think maybe it's those last kind of pushes or things where they can fall back on and saying, Hey, you know, this letter of rec is from someone who knows residency. They know the training. I know them, you know, I trust them, you know, maybe that could be something. I, I definitely think, um, I know we haven't really touched much on um, pre clerkship grades, but the grades are going to get you the interviews. And, but once you're, once you're in that interview, I'm like Mike, Michael said, um, you're most likely you're very comparable. So volunteer experience for me and leadership experience um, were good talking points and also ways that um, I think made me more rememberable maybe than some other applicants. One thing for me um, is that if you have like, I think one thing I was really brought up a lot were like past work experiences. So if you have like any kind of like weird or quirky, like out of the job or out of the box jobs, um, like for me, like a lot of my interviews are like pretty laid back, pretty just casual conversation. And like more than anything, like people love a story. So, I mean, like my first job was at Jimmy John's and that was brought up in probably like 80% of my interviews. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what they're after the typical, like, all right, who are you? Why do you want to do this? They'll like nitpick some things on your applications and they kind of want a funny story or just something that like will stand out to them when they're kind of going back over everybody at the end of the day. So um, any past jobs that you've had, it doesn't have to be like funny, just any like interesting job. If you worked at like a national park, you know, something like that, like that can really make you stand out and uh, can really help you with your interviews. sure if this exactly like helped me too much with my application but going off of what jake said there is a section on your application at the very bottom i believe it's like oh what are some things that you do outside of school so i put that i like to hike and i got asked where i had hiked and all these things and it even tied back to peru because i did get to hike at machu picchu as well so you know what you put in there does matter even if it's just you know, the most random thing and something, you know, you don't think is going to come up because it's not medically related, they could bring it up because they, it is included on your application. So make sure you do include stuff on there because it can be a talking point. So I love throwing surprise parties and editing videos. And I just kind of like put that little bit in there, you know, thinking like, who's really going to talk about this, but that was definitely something that was brought up multiple times. They're like, well, tell us about a surprise party that you planned or what, is, what do you mean by video editing? And a lot of people actually brought up my uh, personal statement just because, you know, I grew up in different places. So I think I talked a lot about like people who read my personal statement who knew me said that my personality came out in the personal statement. So I think, you know, yes, there's research, there's grades. Um, at the end of the day, if your personality can show in your application, that will probably be the best thing that will you know, get you ahead. Okay. Um, going off of that personal statement thing. So um, what would be the best way to go about writing your personal statement? If that makes sense, you know, like what would be the basis behind it? Who's on this video call? Because I use a lot of my medical school personal statement as my residency personal statement. So. <laughs> Um, but that's just me. I had a good story coming into medical school and I kind of just added whatever happened in that time and used the same kind of the framework for my personal statement. I rewrote my personal statement like five times. The first time I wrote it, I realized I was just explaining general surgery for like the whole page and didn't realize that I wasn't even talking about anything about myself or who I am as a person. So if 
you're like me, you might have a lot of drafts. I think it takes time to perfect the pers- like your personal statement. So just start out with something rough and you can perfect it over time. One thing that really helped me when I had something that I liked, I use the MSU writing services. They have, you know, graduate students on there and it's totally free. You just set up an appointment. You have someone not related to medicine, just kind of read over your personal statement and just give you advice on, you know, how you're conveying things or what they kind of took from it. And I, I don't know, I found that really helpful because you reading it over and over or someone else in medicine reading it over and over, um, that's helpful, but it might not be as helpful as just someone that doesn't know you at all reading through it. I think I used a lot yeah. of- Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I used a lot of stories um, that I was able to relate to why I wanted to do the, um, get into that specialty. So. For me, I, I thought stories were a good way to kind of entertain and, and make sure it's not too dry and, and kind of um, too boring in that sense. So I thought for me, stories was a good good way to, to write a personal statement. Um, I danced my whole life, so I somehow tied it in with surgery and how things that I've learned and applied throughout, like I had a leadership position, like as a captain of a dance team and, you know, you had to learn how to work in a group because it's always a group number. I used those and somehow tied it back to surgery and being able to relate the two and um, how I have like, experience and qualities that I've gained over my lifetime <laughs> and that would help prepare me for surgery. So that's what I did for my statement. <laughs> kind of touching on what everybody said, I think you know, regardless of what your experiences were, they look for like a well put together story, basically, you know, how it flows and what led you to that point. Um, so as you're going through your rough drafts, I think it is valuable, like Sonal was saying, to have non-medical people read it. And, you know, if there's a grad lit major, you know, <laughs> they might be the best person to read it because, you know, they can tell you if it makes for something compelling and if it's really explaining you in a clear way. Because, you know, it's easy to put, basically rehash your CV or talk about all the medical things, but you know, talking about how your experience has really led you to that decision and doing it in a, you know, articulate and concise way, I, I think is what most of those places look for. And, you know, there's always going to be a handful of letters that they get that really stand out. But in some sense, you know, they're probably just looking to see, you know what, they're, they're well spoken on paper and, you know, they can kind of give it that stamp and then move on to the other things. Um, but no, sometimes people do a really compelling stories and it really grabs their attention. So, you know, telling the story the right way, I think is the big part. So um, uh, for neurosurgery, I feel like there was, at least from the advice I got from other residents, as I was drafting mine, um, that there was almost kind of a formula that we used, which was um, very similar to what Hannah said, which is, find really interesting things about yourself, whether it's past jobs or experiences, and talk about how does that make you good at what you're applying for. So um, me specifically, I talked about, um, I was a former junior Olympic gymnast and talked about um, kind of how, what I learned from those experiences and how that's gonna make me a good neurosurgeon, like those qualities that I learned. Um, and specifically, since it is such a long residency, they want to know that you're, you, you know what you're getting into, that you understand um, that it's a lot of hard work and that you're going to be in it for the long haul. So that was one thing that everybody kind of touched on. All right. Um, I have another question here. If there was anything you can change about your application, what would you change? I'm not entirely sure if I would change anything in my application. I mean, scores can always be better. You could have always been better on a different test or tried to be involved somewhere else, but it's what you've done. So I did the best that I could and the most that I could in the time that I had and went with it. So I don't think I would change much at all. <laughs> I don't think I would either, but maybe Sonal can help me out here. So I, again, this is probably only useful for Canadians or international students. I used um, my Michigan address on the application and I don't really know if this makes a difference or not, but I kind of wish I'd used my Canadian address and I wonder if I would have gotten more out of state interviews because it seemed like I was getting a lot of Midwest, but not even a lot of like Michigan interviews and in previous years the canadians that i've spoken to that 
wasn't necessarily the case. So I don't know, maybe Sonal, I don't know which address you used and if you think that made a difference. I hadn't even thought of that until right now. Um, I think I used my Canadian address and I was mostly interviewing in Michigan in the places that I had auditioned. And then to answer that question, um, of course, like board scores and everything can be better. And you always think, well, would I score higher? Would I have had more interviews? But um, I think for me personally, I think um, general surgery is getting more and more competitive every year. And they're looking more and more at research in the specialty. And I wish I did have more research experience. Um, that probably would have put me in a better place for academic programs. So if you're looking into something like that, that's what I would recommend. Um, but for a community program, I think that, you know, if you don't have a lot of research experience, that's fine. It really just depends on what you want. All right. So I know we talked about uh, letters of rec a little bit before, but could you guys go over a little bit about the timeline for getting different letters of recommendation? Um, I pretty much got, uh, so for me, I had two letters for ortho and one non, which is an internal medicine letter. And I got my internal medicine one um, during my third year. And then I actually got both of my ortho letters during my auditions, um, but earlier in the season. So it was like, you know, August, September. So they had kind of ample time to submit it. I'd say like for rotations when you're, you know, in your third year, if you ever think that you know, there's someone that could write you a good letter, or like an attending, they got a really good relationship with, um, you should always, always ask them to write you a letter. Even if, you know, you don't end up using it, um, this is kind of, you know, they understand this is kind of the process of how it goes. So don't feel bad to ask them. Again, not, you know, every attending you work with, just people that you really worked with well, um, people that can kind of speak to your character. So, you know, because you also, you might switch specialties halfway through your third year in terms of what you want to apply to. So, I think the timing, you know, always earlier is better, but, you know, later can be okay too. I know a bunch of people that got, you know, letters like November, um, but obviously it helps a lot to be, to give, you know, the physicians ample time to write it so that you're not like rushing um, before applications open, bugging them because I can kind of backfire on you. So always earlier, the better. And um, always ask if you think you get a solid letter from somebody. I think I started asking like July, August, maybe early September, and I gave them like a deadline, which was I think maybe three or two weeks. I think I said October 1st and apps went out October 21st. Yeah, just in case if someone was going to be late, then I could, you know, start testering them and gave myself the three weeks to get something figured out. I'd agree with Irvi. Um, you know, make a reasonable but kind of arbitrary deadline for the people writing your letters so it gives you enough time don't make it the deadline for when you know ARIS closes their letter of rec system you know make it several several weeks in advance because you know as dr bose had even said sometimes people are really great but you know things get lost in the shuffle so kind of set these arbitrary deadlines you know maybe give someone one or two months to to get a letter written you know that's pretty appropriate and uh and, and kind of set that just so you're covering your bases that way and you're not kind of left without something you were hoping for. I actually asked for uh, at least one or two of my letters pretty early and early to in the middle of second or third year, sorry. Uh, so I didn't expect them to write them right away. So in like May, June-ish time, I actually reached back out to them and be, like to remind them that they you know agreed to write me a letter just to make sure it was still on their mind and not waited last minute just in case they had forgotten and then they don't have time to do it. I think with even COVID happening around that time, it was hard to reach out and get a hold of some like internal medicine physicians because they were so busy during it. So I just wanted to make sure I gave them plenty of time to be able to write it and submit it. I did the okay. same thing. I, sorry, friend, I cut you off. Oh, go ahead. Um, I did the same thing. I asked for letters literally on my first rotation and um, my second and third rotations of um, clerkship just because I knew it can take forever to get them and at least by the time I was going to submit my ERAS application um, if I knew I did really well on a rotation I would just ask because sometimes you just won't get the letter because they'll forget and even if you remind them it won't be written or um, you know they will write it and then when you go to submit your ERAS application you will have 
you know, three or four letters and on your ERS application, you can choose which letters to send to which program. So it's nice to just have them just in case you're um, scrambling closer to ERS for letters. Uh, it's just really good to avoid that situation. For me, um, it's definitely sooner is better uh, when you're trying to get a letter of recommendation. I would just say, don't be scared to ask um, an attending that's not within your specialty. So um, I know family practice as a student um, for the outpatient, you get to spend a whole month, usually just the attending without any residents around. And that's a great opportunity for them to um, get to know you on a real um, personal basis since you're working with them um, pretty directly, which you really don't get many experiences like that. Um, most of the time you're working with the residents. So uh, definitely take that opportunity. All right, so we're um, oh, oh, sorry. sorry, I was just Go gonna ahead. add um, alongside of your letters of recommendation that you're getting for your specialty. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's my dog. Um, uh, specifically for neurosurgery, um, they only want letters from neurosurgeons. They don't care about letters from any other specialty, so I didn't bother getting those. Um, but then when it came time to applying, I realized, oh crap, what if I end up having to soap into general surgery and I don't have any general surgery letters? Um, so that might be something to kind of think about just to have as a backup and be prepared for soap if you know, you are considering uh, something like neurosurgery or I don't know, uh, maybe Jake can answer if that's the same thing for ortho um, or not, but some of the um, specialties that are kind of like that. Okay, so we are coming up on eight o'clock, but there have been a, a lot of great uh, questions in the chat. So all the students here, make sure you read the chat because they talked about um, a lot about the number of programs that you should apply to. Um, and all the timeline with that. But basically, um, I would like to thank all of the panelists for showing up today and thank you to um, SNAPS and OMSP um, and OBIGS for hosting with us. And thank you to all the students for coming. If you guys have any questions about anything, we can um, you know, get everyone's contact information and just email us and we will give you their information. Thank you. Bye everyone, thank you for coming.